about all the technical difficulties. For those of you who have participated before, you know this is the first time we've had any real difficulties. Anyway, um, so <laughs> it's Eric's fault, of course. <laughs> let me introduce myself and I'll let Eric introduce himself. Uh, my name is Dina Kaplan, and I'm an attorney with now Vanneman German LLP, which formerly was known as Newman Aronson Vanneman. We had a name change in January, and I am also a, the parent of a 27-year-old who's got multiple physical, developmental, and mental health challenges. And um, I'm also the director of the PET Project. And the Ken Project does parent support groups. And when permitted, we're going to be doing Brandon's Buddies again, which is a play date for kids with and without disabilities to play together. Um, and our firm specializes in special education law, and that's mostly what we do. So I'm going to let Eric introduce himself, and then we're going to go through the slides, and then we're going to have lots of time for questions. Thank you, Dina. My name is uh, Eric Menick, as it says up on the slide. Uh, I've been doing this now for over 10 years, uh, 15 years, something like that. Uh, I've been practicing law for way longer than that. Did a lot of trial law and litigation and very happy to be in special education. I also have a son of special needs. He had learning disabilities, ADHD, and had an IEP. And uh, like uh, many of you, you know, seeking help, found an advocate who was really terrific and told me I should get into this area of law. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> but I have to tell you, it is the first area of law where I really feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives. And Valerie Vanneman, who is the Vanneman and Vanneman German, uh, we met each other, like I said, about 15 years ago. And uh, at the time, it was very interesting. I was working for a uh, nonprofit called Learning Rights Legal Center, run by a woman by name of Janine Steele, who came to work of, at our firm as of May 1st. So it's you know, a very small world. But like I said, I mean, I found myself in, in the position that you guys were in. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, you have people like Dina Kaplan, who are just phenomenal attorneys, incredible, you know, just a vast knowledge of the law. And I was really brought on to the firm just as I can be. I mean, it's, you know, phenomenal good looks that you know, got me involved in this area. So and with that, I will turn it over to the legal mind, the brilliant legal mind, Dina Kaplan. Oh, gee. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I forgot to tell you all is that I'm the grandparent of five grandkids, two of whom are absolutely brilliant and autistic. And so I'm watching my daughters parent them, and I'm helping out where I can. But it's it's been a journey, and it's going to continue to be a journey. So it's, uh, it's interesting for me. Anyway. I want to give you a caveat. As you know, things are changing extremely rapidly to the point where, as I've said before, we're getting whiplash because we're sitting at our desks and every few minutes we've got new notices that something has changed. So what we're doing tonight is basically an update of what we know to this minute. I'm, we do also concentrate a lot on LA Unified because that's where the vast majority of people are going to school these days. But Excuse me, I know that there are others of you from other districts. So if you want to share what's going on in your district, if I or Eric doesn't know what's happening, we're happy to share. And like I said, um, we will leave lots of time for questions after this. Um, but just know that the, um, <laughs> the, the times, they are changing very rapidly. So. What we know for sure is that the federal law hasn't changed. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA, IDEA, is still in full force and effect. And that has never changed since the COVID shutdown. The state law did allow for exemption of time to conduct assessments uh, for a short period of time. And that extension um, ended on July 1st of 2020. So, the districts, um, LA Unified and all the other districts should have been conducting assessments from July 1st going forward, but we all know that that hasn't happened. Some of the districts started not that long ago. I know Conejo has been and Las Virginas have both been doing assessments. Um, 
in person using protective personal ed, uh, equipment, PPE, and um, that's been going on for quite a while. LA Unified, I'm still having problems with several clients in several schools. Um, sometimes the district is trying to do assessments. Sometimes they're saying we're not going to do it yet until school opens for everybody in person. Um, and so I'm happy to hear what uh, experiences other parents have had. I'd like to uh, know what is happening out there in the field. Um, so that's why I put in the slide, what's your district doing? Feel free to chat um, and let me know what's going on with assessment. The other thing that I'm seeing is um, since school is uh, was specifically LA Unified has just recently opened for in-person and a lot of kids are still opting for distance learning. What I'm seeing is, well, school's open, but there's not enough time left in the school year to complete the assessments for the assessment plan that you signed you know, five months ago. So we're gonna wait another several months until school starts again, and then we're gonna do the assessments. So a lot of time has gone by, uh, a lot of wasted time as far as I'm concerned. Um, are you seeing anything else, Eric, like that? Or Yeah, absolutely. That? And you know, the real issue is this, is that, you know, and I'll say this is a, you know, a political statement, but, you know, you have a very strong uh, teachers union out there. And I think unions are great. I think they're wonderful, but, you know, they're really trying to protect their uh, uh, constituents. And so you have, especially in, in districts like LAOSD, you have a lot of pushback for a lot of the in-person um, issues that are, are showing up. And so even if, you know, this whole issue, and I, I saw a couple of questions pop up about the mask requirements, which we'll get to later in the in the day, right. uh, in, the, in the day, in the uh, presentation. But, you know, that even with that, you know, they will have, you know, uh, issues like they'll be doing um, assessments where they have to sit six feet apart with the windows open, with plexiglass in between them, which totally goes against the protocols. On the other hand, you know, I have other districts, um, uh, in particular, uh, there is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Lucimi or Ventura, but I uh, was saying that we're blaming the parents because they didn't want to bring in their child who had not been vaccinated and was immunocompromised for an in-person assessment but was willing to do the assessment online and the school district said no. So basically, you know, the answer is everything that you want, they don't want, and everything you don't want, they want. It is it is really, it's, it's a battlefield out there, as Dina was saying, and it's really an individual case-by-case -case basis. So thank you. And I've had a, that same situation. I, I even had a situation where a child was being assessed and then clearly could, in person, and clearly could not be assessed for, behavioral reasons and because of the environment that the child was in and the family offered to complete the assessment in their backyard in a place where the child was very familiar and the district said no we can't do that because it would invalidate the assessment and i'm not exactly sure how it would but it would so yeah, well, uh, yeah. yeah they either say it will invalidate the assessment or the one excuse i really love is well our insurance doesn't cover our employees outside <laughs> the school yeah, and then you have, to, and then you have to have the parents sign a waiver, a liability waiver. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, with regard to LA Unified, all schools are open for in-person learning. However, like I said before, not all students have returned. Many parents have opted to keep their children on distance learning through the end of the school year. I mean, it's very strange that they would start so close to the end of the school year, but I do understand that they everybody's been pressured to go back to school as quickly as possible. Um, the one thing that I put in here that uh, Butner said the other day was that they've seen differences in different socioeconomic areas and that with regard to the elementary schools, um, the there are less students returning in the lower socioeconomic areas to elementary school um, than the higher socioeconomic areas. And they said the opposite is true for middle and high school students. So. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and then, of course, Butner said, if 90% of the people on a school campus are children who haven't been vaccinated yet, the safest thing to do is to test everybody. And that's where all this regular testing requirement came into play. Um, so the safety protocols are the same safety protocols that we've been hearing about for months now. Frequent COVID testing, wearing masks, social distancing, 
hand washing, small cohorts, and hybrid programs. And we're going to talk about the COVID testing and the mask wearing in a little bit. <laughs> but I just, you know, I mean, these are the things that every school district is required to do in addition to um, new filtration systems and frequent cleaning of the school sites themselves. So, um, and for those of you in LA Unified, the one thing that's kind of interesting is they've started the daily pass, which you can sign up for as a parent and you can um, log into every day and it's an app you can use on your phone or on your computer. And it asks you the same basic health questions that everybody else is asked. You know, have you been exposed? Do you have any symptoms? What's your temperature? All those kinds of things. And so you can do it on a daily basis if your child's going back to school. Um, and uh, so I, anyway, I thought that was interesting. I put a couple of links in the slides so that if any of you don't know about it, um, you can access it. I don't know of any other school districts doing anything similar to this where they have an app in place. Uh, are you aware of any here? No? No, I'm not. I know that they do um, uh, uh, They do uh, similar things on forms in other school districts, but not ones that have an app. Yeah. So you sort of have to sort of come in like you do when you go to Kaiser, where, you know, you have to answer the questions, you do the ask, then you're in, you know? Right, right. Okay. Um, all right. So what duty do the schools have to, to provide services to kids with special needs and they, they continue to have the duty to provide faith or free appropriate public education. Um, we tend to talk in a lot of acronyms. So if anybody doesn't understand an acronym, feel free to put it in the chat and we will try to define it. But the faith is the basic requirement for students in, in special education and they, the law does not ex exclude students from special education if they are not able to wear a mask or be subject to COVID testing because of their disability. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the school still has the same responsibility to provide an appropriate program for a child in the least restrictive environment and provide a program from which the child can obtain educational benefit and make progress appropriate in light of their circumstances. So those that law hasn't changed at all. It um, anti-discrimination is yeah, <laughs> is important in this case in this unprecedented time because what we're hearing about is that a lot of kids are being exempt. And so they're uh, not being exempt, being um, excluded in school because they can't wear a mask. And so when you look at the mask requirements and what the California Department of Education has said is that they are aware of this situation and that some students are being prevented from attending school because they can't wear a mask. And Eric and I were talking about this the other day. I had some clients indicate to me that the schools are allowing their child to come to school but because he can't wear a mask or she can't wear a mask, they get to spend their whole day outside and being taught by an aide and not being uh, permitted to be part of the regular classroom, which, you know, that's not an answer either because that is exclusionary also. So um, anyway, I just, hang on one second. I'm going to have, um, okay. So the mask requirement exemption um, the California Department of Public Health indicated, and this was a while ago in January of 21, that um, the guidance recognizes that there are some people that are not able to wear a mask at, for a number of different reasons. For example, if you're under the age of two, uh, if you have a medical or mental health condition or a disability that would impede you from properly wearing or handling a face covering. Students with a communication disability or when it would inhibit communication with a person who is hearing impaired would be exempt from wearing a mask. And those with communication disabilities or caregivers of the communication of those with communication disabilities can consider wearing clear masks, um, which I think are a little strange, but <laughs> they work, you know, if, especially if you have a hearing impaired person that's reading lips, it's going to be right. important. Um, 
And, and then, okay, so then it says persons exempted from wearing a face covering is confirmed by school district, health team, and therapist must wear a non-restrictive alternative, such as a face shield with a drape on the bottom edge, as long as their condition permits it. I know many of my clients, they, if you try to come toward their child with a face shield, the child's going to run the other way. So, um, and so, you know, this is, this is not a good situation. It's very discriminatory. And um, we really need to be cognizant of what's going on and keep track of what's happening in various schools um, and be able to, to follow through with doing a couple of things that you have options of. And I'm, I think, Eric, you're, you're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but why don't you talk about the master accommodation plan, Eric? I'm sorry, go ahead. That for LA University. Got it. Um, and I think actually someone just posted in the chat box that LA uh, USD has a form that you could fill out that says, you know, uh, you know, why your child cannot wear a mask. Although I will tell you right now, I mean, part of this issue that we're having is that there is, you know, this almost, this, you know, like with the beginning of this presentation, there's a lot of technical issues that people get can't get through. And one of the things that, the, for example, the LAUSD form has, you know, very specific, you have to go to a doctor, you have to find out the reason why the child can't wear a mask, you have to go get that reason. And even if there, you know, is, is a reason why he, he or she cannot wear a mask, um, there's still, uh, you know, alternative uh, uh, ways that they can address the issue, even if they are, um, uh, even if they are, uh, uh, willing to, you know, provide you with an accommodation, they rely on the LA County Department of Health. And I'll read you this excerpt from one of their um, protocols for reopening schools. And it says, alternative uh, protective strategies may be adopted to accommodate students who are on an individualized education or 504 plans and who cannot use a tolerated face mask. Students who cannot wear masks should not be placed with a cohort or group of students in the classroom. They may be able to tolerate face shield with the drape on the bottom, which does not provide the same, same extent of source control or personal protection as use of a property, properly fitted multi-layered face mask. Therefore, a student who cannot wear a mask can receive necessary services in a one-to-one -one setting with staff wearing appropriate PPE, as you know, described, protective something, something. They may also need to be accommodated via distance learning. And that's a huge issue. Because if the LA County Department of Health is basically saying that it's okay if your child cannot wear a mask for sensory issues or whatever the issues, that it's ultimately up to the discretion of the administration at the school to be able to say, well, we can still educate your child. He just has to sit out, you know, over in left field on our baseball field. Uh, he'll have his, you know, one-to-one -one teacher. Isn't that great? Well, you know, education under IDEA is not defined just as academics. It's a whole social, emotional, a whole, you know, process of being in school is much more than just having, you know, uh, 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 being in, able to learn. It's being in a class with your peers. And so, in fact, our firm right now is involved in a lawsuit to say that excluding students like this on the basis of that is discriminatory. It is very difficult in these cases, though, because, you know, on the one hand, you say it absolutely is discriminatory. On the other hand, you know, God forbid someone should get this, you know, terrible uh, uh, virus uh, from a student who could not wear a face mask. Now, the chances of that happening are minimal. So, you know, it's really, as everything in law, it's a balance of the risks. And do I click for the next slide or how do I do that, Dina? I got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, vaccine exemptions. Now, this, this goes back to, you know, much more than just COVID. You know, there are a lot of uh, uh, what we would call, in, in no derogatory terms whatsoever, anti-vaxxers uh, who just don't want to have their students vaccinated. And granted, you know, some people have true medical reasons why their child should not or cannot be vaccinated. And what is interesting, I'm dealing with a case right now where I have a young girl who's 15, and we'll see what happens now, but who was 15 and could not be vaccinated because it needs to be up to 16. And uh, the district was pushing uh, to have the father bring this child back into the classroom, very involved, uh, very disabled young woman. And uh, the father was not comfortable. She's immunocompromised and could not be vaccinated. Um, and so, uh, you know, despite this, they were insisting. And he basically said, look, there, and it's true, there are three exemptions, you know, for medical reasons. 
uh, for children who are in home-based private school or independent study, and finally, for people who have or are on an IEP under that health and safety code right there, you know, you can claim an exemption for being vaccinated. And I will tell you this, that, you know, even if you claim that exemption for an IEP, if you have a child who has like a specific learning disability or something like that, that's not going to fly. Uh, they will say yes, but your IEP does not prevent your student from being vaccinated. So, and that's just the infant vaccinations. This goes back, like I said, before COVID, but it's being applied now to COVID. Um, and, and while right now it's, you can't under HIPAA, you know, be <laughs> questioning people about whether they're vaccinated or not, we'll see, you know, where that goes. Because eventually at some point um, they're going to say, well, it's fine. You don't have to tell us, but if he's not vaccinated or you won't tell us, you know, we're going to say he can't be come back to school. And I cannot wait to see all the lawsuits that, you know, develop out of that. So it'll be a fun time for lawyers to practice in an area that's not really special education, but still it's related. All right, on to the next one, requirements. Yeah. Um, now, this just happened last week. Before it was uh, up 16 and above, they vaccinated. It just lowered the age from 12 to 15. But understand, at least from the school district perspective, there's not a big difference because if you're 12, you're 12 years old, you're in, you know, what, seventh grade, sixth grade, somewhere like that, you know, you're still dealing with over half the population of children in the school system. Now, there's a lot of people who say, well, it's still herd uh, immunity. You know, if everyone else is vaccinated, then the chances of those students, uh, you know, having the, the uh, virus is very limited. And it's true. Um, uh, and, and there is a big push, uh, et cetera, because, you know, they've said, look, I mean, if you have a child right now who is uh, 12 or above, they should be vaccinated. And again, you know, it's it's more than just a, you know, medical choice. It's a personal choice. There's, I mean, there's a lot of personal choice that goes into it. And like I said earlier, you know, no one can actually require you uh, to do a medical procedure, like even getting a vaccine that uh, that you don't want to, uh, unless I don't know why the law that says you have to, uh, like the vaccinations to get into school. Next one. Oh, sorry. Where'd you go? I went backwards. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know, it's funny. You're going backwards. Keep going. Am I? Because the next slide, no. I think, is about going backwards. Oh, there, there we it go. Is. We're talking about regression. <laughs> Just like the slides regressed. <laughs> okay. You're so apropos, Dina. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> here's what's going to happen. So here's, you know, what's, what is fascinating to me, and I just sat through this days long uh, uh, district uh, uh, district special education uh, administrators and attorneys conference put on by the uh, uh, legal something something something. I forget what it stands for because it was really difficult to sit through. But I cannot tell you the number of people who said, "Well, well, we, we don't want to say it's compensatory education. It's not compensatory education." Compensatory education means you did something wrong. We're going to call it COVID recovery, or we're going to call it recoupment, or we're going to call it something else. And as you know, the slide says there, uh, compensatory education services are is in the IDEA, and it basically says that as a remedy, if your child was denied, you know, education or educational services for any reason whatsoever, they're entitled to compensatory educational services to make up for what was lost. Really simple concept. But you know, the school districts are going around saying, but we didn't do anything wrong. It was, it was the virus. It wasn't us, it was the virus. You're like Jerry Seinfeld. It wasn't me, it was the virus. What is up with that virus? So, um, you know, that is, uh, to me, I mean, the whole thing, it's, it's so ridiculous. Because quite honestly, for my clients, I don't care what you call it. You know, my child was denied services, education for the last 18 months. They have now regressed. And what are you going to do, Mr. School District, to make up for that? And understand something. There is a difference between general ed students who didn't learn as much because they had to go online and special ed students who, for the reasons of their disability, could not access their education through distance learning. There's a big difference. The, 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 disab the disabled 
uh, student community was so much more greatly affected by this virus than the general education community to just say, it's a virus, it, you know, it happens to everyone, to me is complete um, hogwash. So hopefully the day, it doesn't matter. And uh, you know, <laughs> is that LUSD has developed a plan. We have a plan. We have guidelines of how we are going to deal with a learning loss. And we will require tailored teaching um, uh, this is, you know, this is like specialized academic instruction. They like to offer you specialized academic instruction. Nobody really knows what that means. So as long as I say it's specialized academic instruction, you can't fight me because it could be great. And usually not, but it could be, it could be really great. Um, the, the issue that we have is, uh, and this is uh, really true, is that we are going to have to have really on a case-by-case -case basis, an understanding of what, in this particular case, for this particular student, what was lost during this time period. Compared to, and it should be compared to not any one other student, but compared to what they could have had, had they had uh, an appropriate education. And if they had had appropriate education, they would have been here. Because they didn't, they ended up here. Well, school district, you've got to make up, I'm sorry, I'm out of the screen here. You've got to make up that space. That is your responsibility. And that's what you've got to push for. And I think it's on the next slide that we have. I just want to interject one thing and hopefully. I'm sorry, I'm not going. <laughs> all right. Hopefully, those of you who have been to a prior webinars know that you should have been documenting all of the ways that your child with special needs has not been able to access his or her educational environment during distance learning, because that's going to be really important. One of the things that's very unique is that you as parents, if you've been sitting with your child during distance learning, you're in a, in a unique situation to see how your child is accessing his or her education that you don't always get the option to see when they're in class. So um, the, on the other hand, the teachers, <laughs> the teachers, nice, Eric. That's your slide, <laughs> it's your slide. <laughs> okay, well, nope, I'm going backwards again. All right. But no, I'll let you talk, Eric, because I know no, you no, no, you're doing great. But it's I think it's important that oh, it that is. teachers don't see what's going on behind the camera or they haven't been able to see what's going on behind the camera. And so parents are at a unique advantage in this situation. But how do we measure regression, Eric? <laughs> you you said just said it. You absolutely said it. And I agree with you hundred percent, Dina. That is the you know, as probably as attorneys, we have a, a little bit of, you know, a, a tendency to want to know what the proof is. What is the evidence that you have? But that's also what, you know, you deal with whenever you go to mediation, with, even in IEP meetings, you want to say, well, you know, and this is a classic case, it was an IEP earlier this week, and my parent is going, well, wait a second, this assessment that you just did shows that there is a second grade leading, or reading level. Literally a year ago, they were at a fourth grade reading level. What the heck happened? You know, and obviously uh, COVID happened. On the other hand, and this is, you know, when the district says, well, we had a pandemic. I said, no, I cannot believe that your average student loses two years of reading level uh, in 18 months because of a pandemic. So when you look at this stuff, it's always about documentation. And speaking of documentation, a lot of IEPs have goals and they measure those goals by teacher observation. I would uh, uh, impress upon you as much as I can that teacher observation is not documentation. Um, because at the end of the day, what teacher observation means is that teacher who may be a wonderful teacher, but who's under a lot of pressure from administrators to uh, say that the student is doing wonderful, their observations may be a little bit skewed uh, due to job security. So I would advise that you know anytime you have the ability to um, uh, provide with you know concrete proof, evidence, write examples, um, uh, any charts, graphs, anything like that, and or standardized tests like I was talking about. So progress or lack on goals and objectives again, you know should be measured in as objective way as possible. Uh, the documentation of what services and supports on the student's IEP were provided. You know there are logs that they keep. You can ask for those logs. You can see how many minutes, uh, you know, uh, a week they, 
with the, they were working with the service providers, and even more importantly, what was done during those sessions to see if progress was being made. Um, and then, you know, as, as it says at the bottom, services that were could have been offered but were not during shutdown. Uh, you know, here is the issue. So you have a student; they have, you know, I don't know, half an hour of speech a week. They cannot access the speech services online. And the school district turns around and says to you, well, we offered them, they were available, um, but your student didn't access them. We're not responsible for that. That's like saying, you know, basically your student was absent for the whole 18 months, and that's not our fault. Wrong. That's wrong. I will just say that's wrong. You know, your, your, uh, uh, the services have to be provided <laughs> that a student can access. And just saying that, you know, because they didn't show up, uh, it was their fault, is absolutely uh, unacceptable. And we're moving on. Anything? Yeah, I just, Tina, I just, yeah. Hold on. Uh, yes, we're moving on. I have a comment about the goal. So, and the thing that's important, like what Eric said, that um, teacher observation is not a measurement of goals, especially in light of the fact that the goals are written for a year. And it's often that you will have two different teachers, a student will have two different teachers, one one year and one the next year. So um, one teacher's observation as to progress on goals and another's may be two totally different things. So they need, goals need to be objectively measurable, um, testing and recording of, um, excuse me, of results on, um, you know, just active recording of the, uh, service that's being provided and what the goal specifically, it's hard to talk in generalizations, but the goal should be objectively measurable. So, um, okay. All right, what's coming up? <laughs> Ending uh, legislation. Um, uh, and the first one, eh, second one, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it, AB 967 provides funds for districts to prevent and intervene early in conflicts and conduct voluntary alternative dispute resolution and provide services to pupils, pupils, pupils with disabilities related to individually determined impacts to learning associated with COVID-19 pandemic school instructions. All right. I don't know if anyone's been through like uh, uh, informal dispute resolution or alternative dispute resolution. My concern always when I read something like this is the fact that it is providing funding for districts to kind of, you know, basically the fox guarding the hen house for they themselves to determine for parents, oh, we're really sorry, we messed up. Your child did not have, you know, 18 months of speech services. So we'll give them, you know, three hours this year of additional services. Exaggerating, but that's the that's my concern as part of their alternate alternative dispute resolution. Um, and you know, you can chime in. I don't know if you are more positive about this or. Well, the thing that I'm concerned about with this is, as um, I am concerned about informal dispute resolution process that LA Unified engages in, is if you if you participate in the informal dispute resolution and you come. To an agreement with the district, the district gives you a legal document that that has all kinds of consequences when you sign it. And my concern would be like waivers of your rights and things of that nature that maybe you as a parent don't understand. And so I always tell clients, if you're going to resolve something during informal dispute resolution or um, what are they calling it? Alternative. Dispute Alternative. ADR. Make sure when you sign something that you understand what you're signing and that you're not giving away any of your child's rights. Um, and that's my concern. On the, the other thing that's concerning to me about this legislation is, you know, who's gonna make that decision? The, the school district is making the decision as to the impact uh, on the child. Whereas I really think this is gonna have to be looked at from a, a looking at where the child was academically um, and on standardized tests if they were appropriate for the child. And then going forward, retesting and, um, and seeing what the regression has been. And I think in some cases it's going to require an independent assessment. So parents should know what their rights are before they sign anything having to do with alternative dispute resolution or informal dispute resolution. Right. 
And so the basic, my basic comment about it is ADR, IDR, stay away from it. <laughs> you know, I, I just, you know, I think it just, if you do not have an advocate or an attorney or someone who's really just, you know, uh, representing you, you're, you're at a huge disadvantage, huge disadvantage. Uh, the second one, on the other hand, I think is actually eases some of the issues that we have had at times, because a lot of the times, you know, school districts rely heavily on the age of a student, the chronological age of a student in terms of determining whether or not they advance year to year. Well, then all of a sudden you have someone who's a child who's developmentally disabled, you know, two or three or four years ahead of where they should be in terms of not only just academics, but maturity, emotional, uh, uh, all sorts of issues that go along with that. It's always, you know, it used to drive me absolutely crazy. I don't think it's true. When people at, especially LAUSD, but other, you know, school attorneys representing school districts would say to me, look, uh, um, you know, advancement from grade to grade is a general education decision. It's not a special education decision. Which I would say, I'm sorry, that's just, I'm sorry, that's a legal term. Uh, it, it means that it's, it's, it's disingenuous, as we like to say. We want to say someone's a liar. We don't say they're lying. We say they're being dis disingenuous. And this is definitely true there, because if an IEP decides that this student is not ready to move forward, that IEP team should be, is able, under the law, to make that decision. Um, and uh, yet, you know, we still come up against this. And this law, what this does, it doesn't make it, you know, a slam dunk by any means. It just eases it and says, that you know, a parent can request that the child be held back at least for that one year, um, and then you know it becomes a slightly easier thing to do. Uh, and uh, having said that, it's still going to be a fight. So, well, uh, and also if I could jump in here. There's the time frame right now. The bill is currently in the state senate education committee. We don't know how long it's going to be there. But the time frame is that the districts are supposed to let parents know that they have this right by, I think, June 15th. Um, and then by July 15th, they're supposed to be making a decision before school starts. And I don't think it's going to, the bill is going to be passed before all these times. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be right. passed. So the question is, is this even going to be um, applicable to the past, you know, the past year and the next school year? I really don't know. Um, so I have it on my list of bills to follow, and um, we will post on our website, uh, you know, any any updates with regard to these right. and anything else. So um, in the, the first slide, we had our um, our web address, and I know that I put Family Focus's web address also, and they have up to date information on their website as well. Um, that's it in terms of our presentation. I. Obviously, we're going to have lots of time for questions, and I want to stop the screen sharing so I can read what some of the questions are. Um, so let me do this. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Gina, did you want to take some questions, or do you want me to read them? Um, I haven't even started to look at them, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I can give you one because uh, uh, mom wasn't able to attend. So she has a. Um, son that has not received any um, speech services since October, October through April, because um, the speech therapist was just not available for whatever reason. Will she be able to get any type of compensation for that time lost? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the question is, do they want in-person services and is the child back in school? Um, the, child, the child's not back in school. And she was wondering if that's something her IEP is tomorrow. And she was wondering um, if she could maybe at the IEP ask to have those services during the summer. Yes, she can ask to have the services during the summer, but the school district generally is not gonna provide those services during the summer. Um, unless there's a speech, unless the child is eligible for extended school year and there's a speech therapist available. But what I would tell the parent is to ask for a block of hours to, um, from a non-public agency, an outside speech agency okay. to, to provide the compensatory services. That's where compensatory comes in 
or regroupment, we don't, recoupment, we don't really care what it's called, but she will have the right to compensatory services. And then what we frequently ask for is for them to be provided by an outside agency. Now, just so you know, this, the IEP team may not have the authority to authorize that, and which point you could go to an IDR and get it relatively quickly, more quickly than in due process. But um, again, make sure you know what you're signing. Okay, thank you. So do you want me to grab some here? Sure. Okay. Um, hmm. This is, are there any, it, are there any news regarding the next school year, whether online learning is going to be still an option for sixth grade SDC at any general ed school? Uh, I, I will say this right now uh, in California, the state of California is supposed to open up completely as of June 15. So the idea is that probably uh, not, uh, um, you know, it, it all depends. I mean, you know, as, as Tina said at the very beginning of this, things are changing day to day. I think that, you know, most, most uh, parents I want their kids back in school. As uh, uh, Dina was saying, there's a slight difference depending on the socioeconomic. Pretty much those areas that were hardest hit are less inclined to go back to school. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, again, if I was to read my crystal ball, I would say it is unlikely because especially like in LAUSD, if they had to do both online and uh, in-person teaching, it would be... Uh, to, quote unquote prohibitively expensive and they wouldn't want to do it yeah, that's my I, take I, I would tend to agree with you and and i think a lot of the things i'm seeing in the chat is that a lot of kids were not assessed this year and and the districts are generally saying you know we're going to assess your children next year most often this happens in la unified um and somebody said even for students who need a functional behavioral assessment well if a student's not in school, it's very hard to do a functional behavioral assessment, okay? The child has to be present in school with people actually observing them, which is what's required for a functional behavioral assessment. And I don't see how it could be done virtually. So, um, and I have several cases right now where children absolutely need a functional behavioral assessment and they're not getting them until uh, the fall or August when school starts again. Um, wow. And Somebody said that the child will not even be able to have initial assessments until the next school year. So that's yeah, a problem, especially if they're transitioning from early start to preschool. Um, I don't know if any of you have children at that age, but it, um, we do. It, yeah. Yeah, they're so, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When well, that's a problem, if the district is saying that they can't do the initial assessment, that's a big problem. So, um, it, I read somewhere, and I'm not sure if this is true, somebody from regional centers participating, I know. Um, it, was regional center continuing to provide services while during the time when a child was not eligible or not able to be assessed for an initial assessment? I don't know yes. the answer to that. They were. I, I, they were? Mm -hmm. I, because that's what I had read. Yeah. And I, I also read that, um, that <laughs> Some, some of the schools were finding students eligible, but defer eligibility was. So they thought, yeah, this child will probably be found eligible when they're assessed, but because we don't know what their eligibility is going to be, we're going to just say to be determined. And I, I saw a couple of IEPs like that, and I thought, well, this is kind of strange. If you Fine, as long as you do an assessment to know what the child's needs are but they're saying they can't do an assessment. So I'm not sure how those IEPs are even valid, but it, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, There's one from Rebecca. She has a child that's in the PALS program. Are you seeing that one, Dina? Yes, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, he went in for in person for three weeks, but at the end of the third week, the teacher and VP met with mom and said he could not come back because he was having trouble keeping his mask on even though they had gotten his pediatrician to fill out the mask exemption form. I tried to get them to work with him on wearing a mask in class, but they wouldn't. They are letting him come in for his individual therapies and he does distance learning 
not super helpful for a three-year-old. I decided not to argue too much because it's the end of the year and he may have to work with his teacher for two more years. But if they try to keep him out at the start of the next school year, I want to push back because he needs socialization more than anything. Can you provide any advice? Thank you very much. I would just like to point out, Dina, that I answered that question in the chat box and I said, yes, hire Dina to file against the school for excluding him without trying less exclusionary accommodations. Or you can wait until next fall. I, uh, I, I you know, it, it, this is something that I think we said this at the beginning, or Dina said it, is that this is something our firm is facing a lot of, these types of, you know, regardless of whether you fill out these forms or not, they're saying, no, you can't come to school. And that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, despite what the LA County Department of Health, what I read earlier said, you know, I mean, at least they're trying to say, you know, you can still provide one-on-one, -on -one, You can still, which I think is wrong uh, to begin with. But certainly if, and I understand that you don't want to make a fuss because your uh, child is going to be with this teacher for two years, but this is, you know, it's kind of crucial that you make sure that your child is getting an education. Right. And, and especially, then, sorry. especially at a young age, especially right. at, at a three-year-old, four-year-old preschool age, it's extremely important. Um, one of the things that I thought I made a slide of, and now I might have missed it or I might have not uh, included it, but you can file a discrimination complaint with the Office of Civil Rights um, through, the, through the U.S. Department of Education. And there's a branch up in Sac uh, San Francisco. I don't know how quickly they're investigating. That's the big problem. And I, you know, I, I feel like if we could get enough parents together to file complaint after complaint after complaint, it might they might take notice. But I have no idea how many complaints have been filed in the last year. So it's a pretty slow process. And then and, and on, on a separate note, uh, both the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, and the CDE, when you file a compliance complaint, the issue that I always have with that is that yes, they'll look at it, they'll say, yes, district, you messed up. And so the solution is more training for your people. Or the solution is uh, you have to pr prove that within X number of times, you won't be doing this anymore. And it provides a solution. Yes, it's very nice that you want to do this for the other students who come after yours. But by the time they get to it, it's really not a solution for your students or an overall solution to make the district better. So I always have issues with those types of, of, of complaints. But, you know, actually, the, I think the OCRs, as they, you know, it's saying it's a little better than the CDE. But, so. but I, I, don't, I think if you really want to get somewhere quickly, the best thing to do is file for due process. Even though that process yeah. is slow, it's not as slow as the compliance complaint or the OCR complaint. Um, somebody posted here that LA Unified is going to be doing assessments during the summer, according to the community advisory meeting, community advisory council meeting. Um, I would like to see that happen. Yeah. I'm not sure it's going to, because in order to do assessments during the summer, you have to have people to do them. And I'm not sure that there are going to be a lot of teachers or not, not even teachers, but you know, teachers and special psychologists and other people that do assessments. I don't know. What do you think? I was there? not, you know, we had a, Janine, you remember, uh, Dina, Janine was at that meeting. Oh, Janine was there? Yeah, and she kept reporting back that, you know, a lot of the stuff that they were saying was sort of the right stuff for, you know, <laughs> the audience, but was things that sort of made Janine, who's been around in this, you know, area of law for, for a long, long time ago, sort of that Scooby-Doo moment of, like, what? really? <laughs> You're really going to do that? You're really going to do that? It's not going to happen. So, yes. They may have said that. Mm, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I would not hold my breath. Okay. Um, there was another good. Uh, can school district create a behavior plan without conducting a FBA, a functional behavioral analysis? Yeah, they can. They can create a, a behavior plan, but it, you know, in terms of drafting a goal for to to combat whatever behavior that they're dealing with, they're gonna need some in, some more long-term data, but they can do an interim uh, behavior plan while they're doing a functional behavioral assessment. But yeah, I should say something about that because um, <laughs> when, my son, 
when my son was in school there, I, he never had a behavior plan. Well, he didn't have a behavior plan when he was in high school and he had a new teacher and his idea of a behavior plan while they were trying to figure out what to do with my son was putting him behind a table and shoving the table at him every time he tried to get up. So, you know, you got to be careful <laughs> how that behavior plan is going to be implemented while they're getting data to, to develop a more intensive plan. So, uh, let's see, what else? Kind of, I'm pulling, going back to the top, see if I missed anything. Yeah, I'm actually going back to this. Someone who asked a question about uh, my children's school, LUSD, has said that they will not be able to do initial assessments until next school year, even for students who have FBA, who need FBAs. <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, they're saying that, that, I guess apparently the school is telling this parent that, uh, that uh, they, they won't even be able to do an initial assessment until next school year. What, what month are we in? <laughs> Well, it's May now, so uh, yeah. But apparently, they're going to be doing assessments during the summer, right? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, according to that, yes, then they should be able to do it. But here's I mean, the issue: there is that depends on when you sign the assessment plan. So they do have, you know, whatever the sixty days to do the assessments and hold the IEP. And if we're in the middle of May and you know their school year ends, I forget when June. Yeah. Something like that. June 10, June 11. Yeah, they're not going to. They they won't conduct the assessment. They don't. They're not required by law to conduct the assessments and hold the IEP. The summer told that 60 day you know guideline deadline. So, however, I will say this: there is a case out of Arizona that says that 60 days is not you know a, a, a shelter for school districts. If your child is acting out, needs an FBA right away and cannot access their education until they get that FBA, get the one-to-one -one aid, you can say, I need that now. 60 days is not, does not apply. That's an exception. The thing, proof. Yeah, it's hard to break. The thing that's interesting is, well, I, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I was doing some research about IEPs in summertime, and essentially the, the um, Ed Code says, you don't have to hold IEPs during the summertime, but you can. So it's not a prevent, you know, you can, but they aren't usually. So anyway. Um, uh, question, a, a little bit of a, of a um, follow up on that. I guess the parent wrote, initial assessment was requested before the pandemic began. Again, the issue, I mean, that's, yeah, you have an issue there. There's an issue uh, with regard to, um, you know, them doing the timely, I don't know when they provide you assessment plan they're supposed to do that with the 15 day deadline and all that stuff if the uh, request was in writing i hope you may have a, a, a case against the district for any issues that lack of assessment may cause um and then dina i have a question for another parent do you would you like to read that i saw it <laughs> i actually saw it the, the parent heard they're going to reduce rsp resource specialist program minutes significantly. He is well below grade level and has regressed academically. If the APEIS does this in the IEP, what do you recommend the parent should do? Okay, there's a little thing that we have in the law called stay put. And what that means is if there's a service being provided in the IEP and there's a disagreement at the time of the IEP meeting to, to so the district wants to less than the number of minutes and the parent disagrees, their option is to say, I disagree and I'm going to go to due process and therefore I'm invoking stay put and the child will be provided the same number of minutes while you're in due process. The key here is though that you do have to go to due process in order to keep that stay put. Stay put means the services will stay put during the pendency of the due process proceeding. So that's somebody put does stay put apply to preschool transitioning to kindergarten it yes but not in preschool okay so the the stay put is basically the same program but you're moving on to kindergarten so the same 
kind of services and program, et cetera. Problem right, the RS, for example, the RSP minutes right. would be stay put. But right. it isn't like you would say, you know, you can continue again in preschool, you know, until the kid is 18, just understand, but that would not happen. <laughs> And somebody said, what yeah, What would be the equivalent program for a PALS class in kindergarten? It would probably be a TK program because that's what they they typically use as a transitional kindergarten program. So, but if you're transitioning from say elementary school to middle school and you are, you know, there's a disagreement as to something, you will still transition to middle school, but you will have the same number of services like RSP minutes pending that due process. So it's become a little trickier when you're transitioning from, you know, from like elementary school to middle school and middle school to high school. The timeline issue. Yeah. This, this was something that I think Dina covered earlier on, which is for a while, and, and understand there's a couple issues. Federal law was not uh, stayed during the pandemic. It was only the California law, which did uh, apply, you know, a specific timeline on you know, the time between requesting assessment and holding an IP to review the assessment. However, in federal law, uh, there is a requirement that be held in a reasonable time frame. And so I would argue that, you know, depending on the you know, individual situation of the child, a reasonable time frame can mean very different things. So uh, my district took 14 months to provide an IEP for an assessment. I'm going to go out on a limb here and get it correct me if I'm wrong. That's too long. <laughs> well, where they they have a pass from the state for a shorter period of time, up to right. June of 2020, but still, you know, still way long. And so, yes, you would most definitely have a claim for compensatory educational services. But what you have to end up doing is going through the process, of getting an IEP, getting the assessment done, having the assessment considered at the IEP meeting, and then disagreeing with whatever they're recommending or not disagreeing with what they're recommending, but indicating it should have been done sooner and this service should have been provided sooner. And then the next step is to go to due process. Um, and just so for clarification, so compensatory educational services, what they look like for each child is gonna be different. It's really based on what the child's needs are and what the district failed to do to meet those needs, so. Also, our schools send out letters stating that they will collect data using several methods, such as online observations for assessments and to determine services. Is this allowed? Sort of. <laughs> so it depends on the assessment, and it really depends on, on what they're doing. Some of the standardized assessments have been um, sort of updated in terms of what can be done uh, virtually and what can't be done virtually in order to have a valid assessment. Um, but, you know, general observation virtually, um, there's a whole lot of stuff that can be going on behind the camera that the school doesn't see, like I said before, and I don't think those are appropriate at all. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I would say one of the things you say is allowed, yeah, I mean, they can do it. The, the joy that I have, um, and I know it's a little bit, I don't want to say sadistic. Some of the joy that I have is when you see those assessments and you realize, as Dina said, that they basically had a kid who was in his living room with the seven brothers, 25 relatives who were all, you know, hurting in the same house due to the pandemic, like my family was. And, you know, this is all going off camera while the assessor is trying to assess this child. And, you know, then I get the joy of being able to look at that and go, come on, really? <laughs> you're, you're saying that this is an accurate assessment? It is really, when you say it's allowed, yes, it's allowed. I, I, I would have a, a field day on of those assessments. Yeah. 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 I would agree. <laughs> a little out of scope here. What can I do as a parent who does not want to send it? Okay. Downstream is in pals going to change. <laughs> want to wear a mask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh. Um, yes. Um, for, so for those of you who, 
I, I'm assuming everybody can see the chat, but the question is, what can I do as a parent who does not want to send their immunocompromised child back to school yet? My five-year-old with Down syndrome is in a PALS program going to transition to kindergarten, and I'm worried he can get sick. He doesn't want to wear a mask and everything he finds he puts in his mouth, and I would definitely be worried about that. Um, one thing you can do is, it's not ideal, but if you get a letter from the pediatrician indicating that it's too dangerous basically for him to go back to school, he can be put on what they call a home hospital program. It's not, it's not a great program because it only gives you one hour a day of a teacher, but it can be one-to-one. -one. It's usually one-to-one. -one. Usually what I meant to say is it can be in person. So the teacher can come to the home while your child is home um, and not able to go back to school. It's designed to be a temporary fix. It started as a fix for kids who like broke their leg and couldn't go to school in person or had pneumonia and couldn't go to school in person. So um, it, it's like I said, it's not the greatest, especially for kids who need the social interaction, but I do understand the concern. And I think one of the things you can do is work really hard with your child and getting him to wear a mask or some other form of facial covering, if it's at all possible. Um, one of the things that I have been suggesting to my clients is that if you have a child that is going to school and is not able to wear a mask, write a goal. Write a goal to work on wearing a mask. And because I don't know how long this is going to be around and who knows what's going to happen in the fall and who knows if there's going to be another surge. But I think masks are going to be around for a while. And um, so while I understand your concern, I think I would really work hard on trying to get your child to at least tolerate a mask for a certain period of the day. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah, but Dana, um, can you share the name slash information of the waiver that you made reference from June 2020 or share the name link June 2020? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah, regarding what? Yeah. I, I, I was looking at that. I remember there was the law that waived the timelines that ended in July 2020. Yeah. Yeah, there was, a, there was a short period of time when the school districts in California were given a pass that they didn't have to, um, oh yeah, okay, that's what she was referring to, that they didn't have to assess students because of the pandemic. And then that, um, that law ended, basically, it was a temporary provision, it ended in July of 2020, which meant that all school districts were required to do the assessments that they're required to do under the state education code and under the federal individuals with disabilities education act so from july 2020 to the present schools should have been doing assessments it started out that some districts were doing you know the virtual assessments and la unified was slow to jump on the wagon to do assessments at all um and then you know and then some have started doing in-person assessments again, uh, much er, much sooner than LA Unified has started. So, um, the link for what, Carla? <laughs> well, she just put the link, I guess, for the law. Oh, thank you, Carla. You're always a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> um, Carla, yeah, Carla's who's Carla? That's a we got to hire her. No, I know, she's, <laughs> and she's my client. <laughs> She gets all the information for me. Awesome. Um, okay, so can we use video recordings of our own child for evidence in due process if needed? Our school frequently reminds us recording is not allowed, both audio and video. You want to answer that, Eric? <laughs> sure. Uh, you, can you use recordings of your own child? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you cannot record other children. You cannot record the classes. Um, and, you know, anything like that. But of course, I mean, it's your child. You know, we often, not often, but we will often, not too often, have videos of views in the process areas of, you know, a child's performance. Generally speaking, it won't be in the classroom because we can't have, you know, the other students. But we'll say, you know, the teacher will, you know, say, God, you know, he's reading at a fourth grade level. And you have a video of the child reading a second grade book and barely doing it. So, because uh, you don't want to have them come in and testify, go through all that. 
the issue that you have, if you have a smart attorney on the other side, is they will say, you know, we don't have a chance to cross-examine him uh, and see what's really going on. And, you know, they, they can, they can if they're smart, keep, keep that evidence out. But you know, we're just, Dina and I, we're just much smarter. <laughs> One of the things that I have been recommending to parents all during the pandemic is, you know, if your child is having trouble accessing any of his education, you know, do some videos of your child. And clearly you can't do a video of the class itself, like Eric said. But, you know, I had so many parents tell me in the beginning that they were running around ch chasing their child with the iPad or the laptop to try to get them to pay attention to the distance learning. I mean, clearly they weren't accessing their educational program. So um, those, those uh, videos, if you have them, will be helpful in an IEP meeting and will be helpful in, in negotiating a settlement. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else have anything? Two, three, four. I have APE instructors, instructors request that parents work on APE goals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've seen parents doing their exercises with their kids on the screen. <laughs> yeah. 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 Parents are learning a lot about education during the last past 14 months of the pandemic. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> Hi, Anna. Nice to see that you're participating. Another one of my clients. <laughs> um, what we say you or do, we have not no way of keeping track of goals. I assume it does do if you're asked to uh, uh, do APE uh, goals. How do you actually work on those goals? <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> If, you know, if the goal is that he'll lift his arm five times uh, with the remote, you turn on the TV, I'm all over that. If it's anything more involved physically, I, you know, it, but in all seriousness, it's really hard. I mean, it's, but it's what, you know, Dina was talking about earlier in terms of anything that you, you in terms of the goals in his IEP, you do want to keep track of it. You want to see where your child is. And the one thing that I will say about my clients in terms of you know, this pandemic is, and I think I said this at the beginning, is a lot of them have said, you know, the teachers were telling me that he was, you know, doing this, you know, that he was able to do, you know, three sentence paragraphs with a topic sentence, middle and an end. And he could do that, you know, eight out of 10 times. He came home, he can't even write his name. I don't understand what happened. And again, this goes back to the, um, uh, you know, teacher, uh, observation issue. In terms of, uh, so what do you do if an, if an APE instructor tells you you've got to keep track of the goals? I, I kind of push back a little bit and say, okay, how do I do that? It's their job to make sure that the goals are being you know implemented and tracked appropriately. So exactly, how are you supposed to keep track of these goals? What are you looking for? You know, uh, uh, how many times is he supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z will be in his IEP, but how do you measure this? How do I report it? What is, am I using? Am I using a chart? Am I using, you know, a graph? What am I supposed to be doing? Get the details from them. And then that's what you, you utilize. Don't let them push that responsibility on you. I agree with that. And one thing that's going to be helpful for kids, and I think I said this earlier, kids who have been assessed using standardized assessments, it's going to be easier to show regression by doing the same standardized test again and, and comparing you know, apples to apples. So if they did the Woodcock Johnson academic assessment a year and a half ago or two years ago, and you do it again, and you can show that the child regressed, that's going to be good evidence of regression. The harder part is going to be when you have a child that can't be assessed using standardized assessments. And, um, you know, for us, like Eric said, we, we need evidence. We need evidence to prove our cases. And, the, and so what that's going to look like for each child, it obviously it's gonna be different depending on what evidence the district has in terms of what assessments were done, what um, logs were kept, what services were provided. Um, but if you parents have been keeping logs or you can even recreate logs of 
how your child was doing during this pandemic, that will be really helpful to, for us to show that the child has regressed and be able to seek an, a, you know, a, an award or a settlement for compensatory educational services. So, okay. Um, do I want well, to we are close to the eight o'clock hour, Dina and Eric. I'm not sure if there's any more questions, but if so, um, definitely you can get in touch with our presenters. I'm sure they can um, give you their email address. <laughs> <laughs> there, that's where we definitely need to hear the Scooby-Doo sound right now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank also, before I forget, Lucy, um, our Spanish interpreter for the evening. This is the first time Family Focus has um, gone down this path, and we really think this is a great job to meet, uh, to reach even uh, more families. I don't see any more. Um, okay, can they share the PowerPoint? Yes, that will be on our, our, our uh, Family Focus Resource Center website on our YouTube page and on our website. So I will put, I put that information, I will put it in again. Um, and also you probably have the email from um, when you registered as well. And Eric put both of our emails in the chat. So it's pretty easy. It's just our first initial of our first name, our last name at bannermangerman.com. Um, plus you can always go on our website and um, contact us through the website so and the website is bannermangerman.com <laughs> bannermangerman.com i was gonna go www <laughs> you know i just wish we why couldn't we just abbreviate it you know andrew <laughs> and a manger man <laughs> any words of wisdom dean or eric before we sign off for our, for the rest of our guests um, i think that's something i want to make a point i want to make is Parents should not be afraid to go to due process or to contact us or any other law firm that does as good a job as we do, which there aren't any, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, don't be afraid. It, you know, parents are concerned that it's gonna cost them money. It doesn't have to, there's lots of options. Um, we can do a free consultation. So it's really important if you have concerns about your child you know, Eric and I are both parents of children that had special needs going through school. Um, Eric's son has become very successful in his adult life. My son is very severely involved and doesn't really have a life since the pandemic happened, but we're working on getting him back into things. But don't be afraid to contact us and don't be afraid to take it to the next level when you have a dispute regarding your child's education. And that's all I wanted to say. Well, thank you so much. And I want to just actually say thank you for this year. We've had these webinars since the um, fall. And um, this is end about our third one. Yeah. Right. And we're going to probably take a pause and probably revisit again in August once things actually open up again. But please check out our websites. And um, thank you so much, everyone. And have a good evening and enjoy your summer. And thank you, Dina. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lucy. Good night. Thank you, all. Thank you all. Be well. Take care. Stop the recording. <laughs> do you know how to do that, Teresa? Yeah, I do. It's here. Just there it is. Huh.